today on the Run to the Top podcast. Because on the one hand, your chip brain is saying, why have you signed up for this half marathon? You know, you, you haven't really done the training and all the people out there, the real athletes, what are you doing? The chimp talk. But meanwhile, your professor brain is saying, but I've paid $175 for this and I've done the training and I've paid a coach and the logic of it. And there's a fight going on. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast from Runners Connect, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. Together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now here's your host, Sinead Hockey. Hi everyone, this is Sinead, back with you again for this latest episode of Run to the Top, brought to you by Runners Connect. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you're having a wonderful day and that this podcast makes it even better. Before we jump into today's interview, I just want to share a little bit about last week's episode, just in case you missed it. I had the pleasure of speaking with renowned dietitian and exercise physiologist Bob C. Bahar on the art of getting both the race results and body composition you want through his concept of metabolic efficiency training. During the interview, Bob answered questions from listeners like you, including how diets like paleo and veganism affect our metabolic efficiency, or in other words, ability to burn fat. As usual with Bob, it was a really interesting interview, so be sure to check it out if you missed it. On to this week's episode. If you ever have thoughts and feelings you wish you didn't, there's a good chance you're human. But there are ways to put a stop to those thoughts and feelings, and that's where Dr. Simon Marshall comes in. A competitive triathlete and a world-renowned sports psychology expert, Simon helps endurance athletes train their brains to become happier and more mentally resilient. A former professor of family and preventative medicine at the University of California, San Diego, and also the director of the graduate program in sport and exercise psychology at San Diego State University, Simon has published over 100 scientific articles on the psychology of exercise, and he's also been cited in scientific literature over 10,000 times. He's currently the performance psychologist for the BMC racing team, an elite world tour professional cycling team, and he's also married to three-time world champion triathlete and his business partner, Leslie Patterson. Together, Simon and Leslie make up Brave Heart Coaching, where they help athletes strengthen both their bodies and minds. And they also recently published a book called The Brave Athlete, in which they share actionable solutions to the most common mental barriers we runners face. Today, Simon will share a little bit about those methods, and he's also been generous enough to offer one lucky Run to the Top listener a free copy of The Brave Athlete, complete with Simon and Leslie's autographs, and a personalized message. So if you want to put your name in, you can do so by joining our Run to the Top Winner Circle group at runnersconnect.net forward slash winner. The contest is exclusive to group members, so be sure to join for a chance to win and also access to a bunch of other insider content coming up in the new year. And one more thing before we jump in, while we usually like to keep Run to the Top pretty clean, this episode has a little bad language here and there. We left it in because I think a few expletives are only natural when talking about things like, you know, our deepest insecurities and doubts. But in case there are any small ears around, I just wanted to let you know. As usual, after a quick break to thank our amazing sponsor, Health IQ, we'll be right back with our interview. Did you know you can save on life insurance just for being a runner? Health IQ is an insurance company that works to reward health-conscious people like you with lower insurance rates. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com forward slash runnersconnect or mention the promo code runnersconnect when you talk to a Health IQ agent. Thanks so much for joining us, Simon. Thanks for having me again. It's a delight to be back and uh, to talk more about brain stuff. Absolutely. So Simon, before the interview and I were, uh, we were talking about our last interview together, which was for our mental training summit. And I'm so glad to have you on again. Your interview was fascinating. I think it was definitely one of, uh, 
one of our listeners' most favorite interviews of the summit. So great to have you back on and um, really looking forward to getting a little bit more in depth on this topic. So Simon, before we jump into your new book and uh, everything you do, can you tell us a little bit about your background, when you first started um, running, what prompted your passion for the sport, that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually started off as a cyclist, a competitive cyclist from the age of sort of 12. I'm in my late 40s now, so it's a, a long time. And then I, in college, I met my now wife, uh, who Leslie Patterson, who's a professional triathlete. And my exposure then to swimming and running uh, was uh, forced upon me. <laughs> and so but I learned to love running uh, mainly because it was the time efficiency of it. And I just did a bang for my buck. It was great. And, m- and my wife really showed me how to enjoy running. And like most new runners, we all try and run too fast, particularly <laughs> men. And so the idea of having the equivalent of like a, a coffee ride, but a run equivalent never seemed possible until I, she kind of showed me the rope. So I'm pleased that that was the case. But I started off uh, when I met Leslie and my wife, um, I was finishing my PhD in sport and exercise psychology, and I was consulting in a number of different sports, trying to help people uh, make make better use of their noggin so that they could get their brain out of their way of their body. Uh, and but I started to have a bit of a love hate relationship with the field back then. This is a twenty years ago now, uh, or fifteen years ago, because all of the things that I was taught and trained to do, uh, some of which didn't seem to resonate with athletes or some of it didn't seem to frankly work. Athletes would roll their eyes or some of the some of the exercises, you wonder whether the person recommending them has ever done any sport themselves, deep in psychological theory. And, and, uh, and, and so I became a bit frustrated. And then I married a professional athlete and it was like, whoa, uh, the, the curtain has been pulled back on the real life, the real inner workings of the head of, a, of, a, of an athlete. And so particularly uh, competing at that level. And so Leslie and I started to work on ideas together about, well, what aspects of the practical uh, know-how that you get from being a competitive runner or triathlete, uh, uh, how do they combine with psychological science? I'm a scientist at heart. So those two things led us to create uh, uh, or write our book called The The Brave Athlete. So it represents sort of where where practice and and, uh, theory sort of mix in the middle. So it's evidence-based, science-based, but it's also really practical and it gives strategies that perhaps you don't find in other sports psychology books to help your your head, uh, you know, uh, not be the source of sabotage on the, on when it counts. Mm, Yep. I, I, I I love everything that you and your wife are all about. Um, Your, your website and your company, Braveheart Coaching. I just love that everything you guys do is kind of no BS. It's very, very straight to the point and very uh, actionable, which is sometimes hard to find in the world of sports <laughs> psychology. So, oh, well, it's well, it's funny because you say that. So, I spent you know twelve years as a university professor in in a med school doing sort of what is essentially health psych, applying mm-hmm. these sorts of principles in health, but. But I also found that the, the frustrations I had with sports psychology there too. And then when, when, you know, Leslie, when I met with real patients, real humans or athletes, you know, people with, who are just living their normal lives with normal brains, uh, and the, the, the psych and the academic speak didn't speak to them either. And so I really think that this kind of no BS attitude or no BS approach is really important. It's like learning to speak the language of normal people. Because if, if, if the strategies and the techniques are going to have any impact or at least be people are going to commit to trying them, they have to buy into them. They have to get why they're doing them. And that's, the, that's one of the biggest challenges of all, particularly in sports psychology, to say, listen, it isn't all about psychoanalysis and you're, you're crazy. That's why you're, so, uh, you're doing it. Or it's all just all about visualization and goal setting. You know, there are other things that you can do that are much more down to earth. So I, I kind of like the, uh, the, this, this intersection. That's where I've been fascinated now with my career. Mm, yeah, absolutely. You, like you said, you two are pretty different from the the uh, normal crowd of sports psychologists in that you're experienced athletes and you know how to bridge the gap between theory and something that you can put into action. <laughs> so I'm I'm so excited to get into everything you guys do and uh, especially your latest book, The Brave Athlete. But first off, uh, Simon, can you tell us a little bit about Leslie, your wife? I know you guys train together. I know you, yeah. uh, you've got a, a 
you're kind of like a power couple in that regard. So you guys, <laughs> well, said, I'm, I'm yeah. not sure about a power couple, but I tell you, I am. I am. Her, I am a domestic general supporter, and a, <laughs> and and it's funny because I'm kind of known. I don't want to swear on your show, but um, I'm sort of. I am. I do play a little bit of a, a, a an assistant on race day. You know, you need a sherpa. Every every athlete needs a sherpa, and um, so my my sporting life kind of took a back seat to someone uh, who was making a career out of it. And, um, so, so what, what the way this sort of came about is so the Leslie is, you know, um, she's a Scottish lass, uh, so Scots are strong and proud and they wear their heart on their sleeve and there's no BS. And this is where I learned the real ropes about sports psychology from. And, and so she started off as a runner, a national cross country champion in Scotland, and then moved into triathlon and became on the, got on the national G, great Britain team. And that's when I met her when I was doing my sports psychology degree, but kind of, she then fell out of love with the sport because she was started to get treated like a pair of uh, legs and lungs and nothing mm-hmm. really the, to dealt with, with the thoughts and feelings of a young woman. And it, and and in sports psycho sports psycho in sports science in, in top level coaching now there's a an overwhelming concentration of sports scientists doing the coaching so exercise physiologists and so on that's not a bad thing at all but many of them really lack a bedside manner they really don't know how to talk to people mm-hmm. and uh, uh, empathize and so this really made her quite disillusioned with the sport and it it pains me to hear when I met her and she was like 19 at the time to, you hear coaches tell her that she's too fat mm-hmm. uh, and overweight. And, and it just as a psychologist, it breaks my heart to hear that's, that, that's not only the topic, but that's how you're having this conversation. And, uh, and so she kind of uh, fell out of love with the sport, gave it up, took up acting and we moved to California and she started from the UK and she started acting and learning how to create characters and kind of got more in touch with uh, her creative side and, and uh, did a master's degree in theater and, but then came back to the sport on her terms. And then with this sort of mental toolbox, I don't know what, what, what do you call it, some of these techniques that we kind of developed together in combination, she started to find her feet again as an athlete. And she, it's no coincidence that once she did that, she became a three-time world champion in, triath- mm-hmm. in, off- in off-road triathlon. She was doing it on her terms. She's, she's incredibly mentally tough, but she's learned those lessons the hard way. She wasn't born with them. And she's able to find, you know, in pressure situations or when the expectations are high and you really need to be the best you on the day, she's now able to have a mindset on the start line that is really quite remarkable. And we, we actually, in our book, we have a word for it. We call it finding your fuck it moment. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you want to start on, uh, the ideal would be or you, you start every race not caring what other people think about you, who's there. It's kind of, you're there for your own pleasure. You're doing it for the enjoyment. You're connected to your passion. You're focused on process. And when all those things, like all the stars align, you're able to do that. You have, lo and behold, amazing races, right? And, and not, you don't always have amazing races, but if you don't have a good race, at least you finish saying, you know what? I gave everything I had. There's nothing more I could have done. Uh, so you're not, you know, when you do your post race autopsy, you're not going through the, oh, I threw the towel in there. I should have done this. If only I'd done that. You're saying, listen, that wasn't enough. And if it's not enough on the day, so be it on to the next one. And she's been able to do that pretty much now for the last sort of 10 years as a competitive athlete. It's pretty awe inspiring to watch. I'm not saying that just because she's my wife and I love her, <laughs> but just as, a, you know, with my professional hat, she's pretty cool, my wife. And I love the way that she approaches things, challenges like that. She's taught me a lot. Mm, yeah, she seems I, I love her story as well. And uh, maybe at some point down the road, we can have both of you guys on the show. But she seems to have really found the resiliency that you uh, you kind of need for long term success in the sport. And she's she's conquered that clearly. But I think it obviously it's taken um, some time and obviously uh, maybe a little bit of adversity to attain that. So that being said, I think she probably has, Simon, quite a bit to thank um, you for. I, I know you are incredibly supportive. You're the founder of Team uh, Supportive Husbands in Training, which spells out <laughs> a really, really nice acronym there. But uh, oh, Come on, Shay. What, what is the acronym? <laughs> Spell it out for us. I'm going to force you to say it on air. <laughs> All right. Team shit. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we've officially lost our uh, queen rating on iTunes for this episode. Oh, and that's so, that's fine. Sorry. No, that's that's fine. I think uh, you can edit that out. I'm sure. <laughs> I think our <laughs> listeners will, will appreciate maybe a change in pace for the uh, right. for the show here. But so, Simon, uh, again, you're the founder of Team Shit. Yep. 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? What what led you to start that team and, and uh, who can apply for the team? Who who qualifies? Yeah, that's funny. Well, it's, so team uh, SHIT is really an acronym for support husbands in training. <laughs> uh, it's just what a convenient acronym, right? But, <laughs> but it started because, uh, you know, following uh, my wife around and helping her at uh, races and you become friends with other competitors and their partners. And, you know, I'm in the enviable position to have a wife that's much faster than me. I love that. You know, I love the fact that she's the, she's the kick-ass athlete in the family. And lo and behold, when you're kind of on going to races, you meet all their partners or you meet, you know, or fr- even training partners locally. We're in San Diego. There's lots of top athletes here. And you meet their partners and, and lo and behold, there's lots of me's out there too, right? The, the, they say in every relationship, there are flowers and there are gardeners. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'm a gardener, uh, a nurturer, and I love that. And uh, and so, and I met a load of other gardeners out there, men who are and 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 wives, uh, lesbian couples, supporting their partners uh, to be top athletes. And so, we all have one thing in common: we all, you know, enjoyed uh, supporting our partners, but we're also we're athletes ourselves and trying to train and do all those other things. But we were just always a lot faster, or, or get, getting uh, 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 chicked by our partners. So. Mm-hmm. So then we sort of like form this little group and uh, we, you know, we do some training together. We have a laugh about it. And we're all of us are, are amazed at why anyone would uh, ever feel threatened or have their ego threatened by, be, by having a faster partner. Uh, so we love it. So team <laughs> shit. We're all the way. <laughs> I love that. Uh, for for our listeners who maybe feel that they might be might qualify for team shit, where where can they kind of join <laughs> in the fun? Yeah, you, you can come to our website. You can email us. It's a very select group, right? There's a very uh, a good initiation ceremony. And you and you actually have to provide documentation objectively that your partner is objectively faster than you. Uh, so we don't take your word for it. We need results uh, of you being in the same race. So, uh, it's you know, we'll, uh, we'll evaluate those on a case-by-case basis. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's awesome. So... That's that's so cool. I love your your um kind of weeding process there too. That's that's awesome. So Simon, obviously you and Leslie, you you kind of train together quite a bit. You you know you've got a a relationship that does revolve quite a bit around her competing and her performance. But you're also uh, partners in business, and so I know you guys you work together for Braveheart Coaching, or also known as uh, BC Squared, and. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. What what um, you know prompted you guys to start this business, and what's it been like since you started? Has it kind of gone off without a hitch, or has it been a kind of a process, uh, ongoing process to get that going? Uh, I think you know, like most businesses, uh, it's you know we've made probably every every mistake possible, uh, <laughs> and and that's that's good, right? We look upon failure as uh, as as sort of guidance and learning how we can do things differently. So yeah, Leslie was, as, as many professional athletes are, she, she was coaching athletes, doing the physical training of them to, to help provide income for, to, to be a professional athlete. Cause you don't earn that much as an endurance athlete. And when I got frustrated with my job in academia, 10, 12 years, I was getting a bit burnt out, traveling too much. And, and I decided to leave and Leslie, um, was one of those, uh, I've got, again, uh, uh, her support of my saying, you know, you spent all, all this time in education, you're going to leave a tenured professorship. Are you crazy? Most partners might say that. She said, well, listen, you come home and you moan about it a lot, but you never seem to do anything about it. You know, the irony wasn't lost on me. I was in behavior change. Um, so she said, just leave, just quit. I said, well, I've got, what, what, what would I do? I'm not really skilled for anything. Well, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm in academia, but what we, see, uh, you'll figure it out. We'll figure something out. So I, I, I quit, uh, cold Turkey. And then I started to help her with the, I mean, my background is in sports science. So obviously I could, uh, I could help with the coaching as well a little bit, but they wanted Leslie to coach them. You know, <laughs> she was good at it. So I started to do in my good team shit role and my gardening role, did the admin and, you know, uh, making sure that, yeah, you know, improving some processes and that kind of stuff. And then started to uh, speak to the athletes about mental training. And so that out of that, about five years, uh, f- sorry, three or four years ago, that started. And I then kind of then started to work alongside her as, as a co-coach. So we have a physical coach and a mental coach and we talk to one another. That's one of the advantages of being married over the dinner table. Mm-hmm. You talk about athletes and issues. And so it's not this sort of disconnected part. Uh, and what we found is that not only uh, does uh, my sort of n- uh, getting to know them 
uh, and their relationships and their work stress and all the other things and also some of the strategies that I was trying to teach them to be more mentally resilient. Um, I needed to know more about their physical training. So I would like ask Leslie about, you know, she'd log on to training peaks. I'd look at their physical training and give her opportunities to insert opportunities to kind of do some, implement some of the strategies or designate some sessions as mental toughness sessions. And she would do the same. She would have athletes that with a, or in plateaus or slumps or just frustrating about not being able to get how to figure out how to move on. And so I would sort of uh, provide provide uh, uh, input. So it's sort of this really nice sort of holistic process now uh, where we both have to get involved with them uh, and really get to know them, right? But, uh, listen, coaching's a relationship. And it's built on trust. Uh, it's not just about drills and sessions. It's about getting to know what someone needs and wants from you. And often athletes, they don't even know that themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't, they might say, I want to get faster. But then when you're perpetually frustrated that they're not doing the work that they've set, you've set for them, which is one of the common things that coaches say, well, uh, the coach will say, well, if, if you're not going to do the work, you need to find another coach. I'm not the coach for you. <laughs> Uh, that that always that struck me as a, as a strange way to go about it. It's like, okay, we need to try and figure out why. What are the barriers you do to, to this? And so that becomes a psychological or behavior change problem. And therein was the sort of genesis of doing it together. And we feel that it's really important. All of our own personal experiences in sport that have really kind of been breakthrough moments for us have come from the combination of sort of, you know, coaching the head and the body. Mm. So we think that our athletes uh, are probably the same as us. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's what I love about what you guys do. You look at the whole athlete rather than, you know, data or whatever numbers that your athlete gives you via email or however you guys work. So that's, that's really cool that you guys do. You do kind of play off of each other's strengths. You more, you kind of deal more with the mind and Leslie more with the physical side of training. So it's really cool. So Simon, going off of that, um, first of all, who would you say on average is kind of your, your clientele? Who do you work with for the most part? Is it mostly triathletes, runners, or, or is it kind of a combination? Yeah, it's really endurance athletes. So it's runners, triathletes, and cyclists, uh, and duathletes, you know, endurance sport, uh, the two of us combined. Now, I, I also do uh, mental coaching for other sports uh, that outside of sort of Braveheart because people come and say that I've got my own coach. I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a, a national pistol shooter or a, I'm a short track speed skater and I'm dealing with X, Y, or Z. And so many of the principles apply. So I do work with a few clients uh, outside of endurance sport, but 90% of our work is in a triathlon, running, cycling, duathlon, and ultras. So uh, that's really where we kind of sit. And that's what we know so much better. After the break, Simon will discuss how he and Leslie customize training depending on both mental and physical feedback. And he'll also share his tips for training the brain to zap the intrusive negative thoughts holding us back. This is Sinead Hockey, and you're listening to Run to the Top at Runners Connect. wonder why we get penalized by life insurance companies for things like family history and BMI, but we don't get rewarded for, you know, running and being active. If you can save money for being a good driver, it only makes sense that you should save money for living a healthy lifestyle. And Health IQ agrees. Health IQ is an insurance company that uses science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance for health conscious people like you and me. And that's pretty amazing given science shows risk of heart disease is 49% less and risk of all-cause mortality is 30% less for runners than it is for the average Joe. Not such a bad bonus for logging some miles. And what I really love about Health IQ is that you can actually submit your running logs to get lower rates. All you have to do is plug in your data from Strava, RunKeeper, Garmin, and even your latest race results to save as much as 25.5% on your life insurance. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com forward slash runners connect or mention the promo code runners connect when you talk to a Health IQ agent. Thank you so much to Health IQ for sponsoring Run to the Top and for rewarding runners for doing what they love. 
We are back with Dr. Simon Marshall. And Simon, earlier you shared a little bit about your dynamic with your wife, Leslie, in coaching athletes. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit further. I know you two really individualize training based on feedback that you, Simon, get about your athlete's mental state, and then also feedback Leslie gets from the athlete's performance and training. So can you tell us just a little bit about how that works? Are you two just constantly relaying information to each other and then changing things on the go, or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, it's, there's, uh, there's no really one one way that it happens, really, because each person is an individual. And they come with different levels of motivation for this sort of stuff or resistance, right? So there are some athletes who we uh, um, uh, we coach who I'll do like I'll chat to them on the phone when they first sort of sign up with us, and Leslie will have had her chat with them about how it works and the drills and blah blah. blah. And then I'll talk to them just about hey. How you doing? Who are you? Let me know. Let, here's, here, I'm introducing myself and their lives. And so it's more of like a, a meeting a new friend and so you're getting to know someone. And, and I offer them the opportunity if they want to do, you know, interest in exploring how they be, can become more mentally resilient or if they've got particular issues that they think might be psychological or mental for them, then we can take that further. And most of them do that. But there are some that say, no, I'm good. I don't need any of that. I'm fine. You know, and I don't push that at all. That's not the goal. But Leslie's physical training also has some uh, uh, stealth mental training embedded in it. We've just given our secrets away. Um, so even when they don't, if they don't speak to me, certain elements of her training that she sets are designed to 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 get at different elements of uh, sort of you know uh, mental skills for 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 training and racing. But if they are interested, I'll send them a little questionnaire. And, and, and questionnaires in psychology are, are mostly terrible. And mine, mine included is pretty terrible. There aren't any real good ones. But what, what, what it does do is I, I ask people to say, OK, to, to, so we can sort of, you know, uh, make this a bit more efficient of our time. I say, OK, tell me a little bit about what goes through your head when you're training. Uh, and then tell me a little bit about what goes through your head when you're racing. And so they'll be, they'll, they're literally writing sentences. They'll say, I'm thinking this, and this is what happens, and blah, blah. And then I'll say, okay, so I'll ask them other questions like, so how would people generally describe you? And they write down the how people describe them. And then I ask them a question like, well, but what is it that but most people really don't know about you is, and then they tell us, you know, their little secrets. It might be that I'm actually not as confident as people think I am, or I'm worried that, you know, I'm going to be whatever, whatever. So it's a, it's a way of sort of getting behind the veneer of uh, what you would usually get when you ask someone, tell us about, you know, uh, what mm -hmm. you're like as an athlete. They'll give you, because, you know, we're, we're prone to what they call social desirability, right? I want to, I don't want to show weakness. I want to impress my coach. And I don't want to be looking as though I'm struggling. And then, and then I'll ask them to self-rate on about five dimensions uh, of that are important for sport. For example, the ability to control your emotions or the ability to suffer or the ability to, to focus your attention. And they rate themselves on a scale of one to 10. And they explain why they've rated themselves that way. And so the, this, this little questionnaire, it's not, it's not a diagnostic tool. Or anything. It's just a, an entry point to have conversations. So if someone says, you know, my, my motivation uh, is a, a nine out of 10, but my ability to control my sort of negative emotions uh, is like a two out of 10. That tells me a little bit about where we might start, right? Focusing. So we want all of the things to be rated highly. So it's just a way of sort of narrowing in on particular issues that they are uh, dealing with. And lo and behold, that when you have what might present to you as something like, you know, I worry about, I get anxious before the swim, Oh, sorry, in, a, or in running terms, I really get anxious for the bit, my big A races. I'm on the start and I'm looking around and everyone looks fitter and stronger than me. And oh my God, I mean, all the imposter <laughs> syndrome feelings. And then you find that when you talk about these things, you know, your sporting life isn't in a vacuum. You, you, you there are other ident parts of your identity as well. And lo and behold, you might feel like that in other aspects of your life as well. So mm -hmm. it's really, you know, and that's why I often refer to it as performance psychology rather than sports psychology or lifestyle psychology. It's like coping with life shit balls, right? It's learning how to have, you know, fewer thoughts and feelings that you don't want, feeling happier, enjoy, enjoy activities more, even though they might look as though that they're, they're, they're pressure filled or, or, or stressful. So, and that, and that has far reaching implications, uh, outside the sport. So it's kind of a little bit of, uh, uh, in holistic in the truest sense, and that it goes beyond, beyond just your ability to start train and race. Mm, that's, that's fascinating. And I, again, I love that you guys really do try and work with your athletes to pinpoint what anxieties they 
deal with as individuals. I know there are so many different mental barriers and, uh, in your, your book that I want to talk about, you, you and Leslie recently came out with The Brave Athlete, Calm the Fuck Down and Rise to the Occasion. <laughs> You're going to get uh, banned by the oh, FCC. I know. What the hell? <laughs> Should I go? Forbid. What have you done? There's I know, two swear words. I know, but I, I love the title. This is something that I, I, I've i said <laughs> verbatim to myself on the start line of so many races. I love that title, but... Uh, uh, I think our <laughs> I think our audience will be OK with this, I think. Uh, but um, the, in the book, Simon, you guys kind of break down the most common mental barriers into three or 13 kind of different categories. And I, yeah. I kind of want to run through those and um, maybe maybe have a little bit of an exercise with our listeners today and see which of these they might feel kind of kind of really applies to them where they can maybe improve their mentality a little bit? Can we kind of run through those yeah. 13 yeah, mental yeah, barriers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, to start with, it's like where do these 13 things come from? Mm-hmm. And and we were really eager to, to not write a book that was coming from the sports psychology, you know, science academic towers of where this, you know, what we think is important. And so we didn't want to write a book that was only sort of technique focused, like here's a chapter on goal setting, here's a chapter on stress management, Here, because that's how that's not how normal people think. They come to you and they say things like, you know, I just feel fat. I know, I know objectively I'm not, not this or that, but I just feel that there are some days I just can't bear to look in the mirror and I don't like it, whatever. Uh, or they say, I need, I just need to harden the fuck up. I mean, I just, you know, I get, so that's how real people think. So we, when we sat down to think about them, we took, we've thought about all the athletes we've coached. We talked about all the things we've consulted with all of our own experiences. And we said, these are the issues that seem to be the most common that we get the most questions about. And these issues appear to us or get told to us in this exact way. So the chapter headings are almost like verbatim quotes of how they come out of athletes' mouths. Uh, so, so one of the chapters is called, I wish I felt more like an athlete. Mm. Right now, underneath that, we're talking about athletic identity and how that you change your thoughts and beliefs about how you see yourself as an athlete and what the how you know people are having troubles with athletic identity because they'll talk to you and they'll say things like, "Oh, I'm just a slow, you know, half marathon. I'm, I'm just a slow. I'm just an age grouper. I'm just. I'm ju- they've got a case of the justers. Mm. Right? They're all. They're already excusing their their abilities before they've even described them, uh, and so. But they don't come to you and saying, "I've got problems with my athletic identity." Uh, they 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 talk in much more uh, in much more real terms. So so I wish I felt more like an athlete was one about identity. Another one is mm. I just don't think I can, which is about confidence. So we have a whole chapter about confidence and building self belief, an actual and an actual fact, and how the psychology of confidence is actually far more nuanced than just thinking about the construct of confidence. There's things like self-worth, self-belief, self-efficacy, self-esteem. So what's the difference between all these things? And where can the psychological science actually help us as athletes know where to look for the right solution that's matched to the kind of self-judgment problem that I have? Mm. So I don't think I can is another one. Uh, Another chapter is called Setting Goals is Not Your Problem. Uh, it's really the secret of doing. So this chapter is about, listen, I've got all of the, I've got all the best intentions in the world. I know exactly what this, I know how to intellectualize where I want to get to. I know how to do that. But when it comes to actually doing it, that's a whole different ball of wax. And so we wanted to get behind the fact that, you know, we've never, or, or to be clear, that we've really never met an athlete that doesn't know how to set goals. You'd never know this because that's probably one of the most common topics in sports psychology mm-hmm. written about. But I've never met an athlete that doesn't know how to set goals or why they're important. The human brain is goal oriented by nature. Mm-hmm. The human mind, we're goal oriented as people. So the question is, how do I turn these ideas of what I want to accomplish into actually physically doing it, getting your ass out of bed at 5.30 in the morning, or mm-hmm. I've had a hard, stressful day of work and that glass of wine is calling me at home, <laughs> but I, I need to try and fit in a, a session at the gym. How do I, how do, I do that <laughs> outside of the goal? So <laughs> that was another one. Um, one. One other chapter we've got was about uh, uh, social media. And Mm. we called this, uh, other athlete. This is the title of the chapter. Other athletes seem tougher, happier, and more badass than me. (laughs) Uh, so this is really about the power and the peril of social comparison, right? The fact that we go on to Facebook or Instagram and all we see 
are pictures of people who look as though they've got everything together. They're lean, yep. they're tan, they're fit. They're, they're always posting like amazing selfies of hard runs or screen captures from their Garmin. And you're thinking, oh my God, I'm a loser compared <laughs> to this, right? And so it's getting into the psychology of what we call impression management and actually how the, what you see on social media is a very – uh, a sort of curated version. It's the highlight reel. It's the Heisman mm. Trophy highlight reel of people's <laughs> lives. It's not real. And how do I get to know, how do I get a better filter so I don't come away feeling sort of depressed and a bit sad at how rubbish I am, you know? So that was another chapter. I know, sorry, I'm wi- I'm waffling on here. No, but I absolutely. Get so about so many, I'm like kind of, and I feel like I'm checking the boxes off because so many know, of these apply to me and I know well, it's funny because our, our, the, the book is not really designed to be read from like page one to the end because mm-hmm. the, of these 13 issues, we reckon that pretty much every athlete can identify with three or four of them. Oh, yeah. Some athletes, mm-hmm. maybe one or two, some athletes, 12 of them, right? Mm-hmm. But most of us have at least one of these can resonate. So that's, that's, that's exactly how it's kind of meant designed to be read, that you zero in on the chapters that really connect with you. And the chapters have all been structured in the same, every chapter is structured the same way, is that we open with a, a sort of a description of what the issue is, like the, I wish I felt more like an athlete. And we mm-hmm. give an example of an athlete that we've coached and we tell that we describe what they said to us and what the interaction was like. And we've changed their names so they don't get too embarrassed when they see <laughs> their names in print. But then we, the second thing we do is we unpack the psychology of it. So what's what, what, would, what would a psychologist say about this issue and what's the going on? So we do get into a little bit of the science and the research on what this does. And then we we come up with some strategies. And, and, and the book has been designed a bit like a workbook. So there are there are exercises that you write in, in actually in the book that we ask you to write down five things that this and think about this and now what goes through your head and, and so on. So there's some exercises. And then we finish every chapter with a case study. Again, a real athlete that we've worked with where we've implemented these strategies with them. Uh, and it's not always the person who we open the chapter with. We don't want to make it, you know, we've got 13, uh, 13 issues and there's only five athletes that appear in the book. Mm-hmm. These are based on hundreds of athletes. So we want to show you that what it looks like in real life. And the reason that's important is not just so athletes can see it working, but we were also eager not to paint an overly rosy picture of, oh, just do this thing. And then this athlete followed our steps and then miraculously all <laughs> of their issues disappear because we know that's not reality either. So in the case studies, we talk about, well, we tried that and that certainly didn't work. We don't know why it didn't work. And here's how they said it didn't work. And so we tried this. That didn't work either. So we tried another thing and that finally did work. And here's why we think that worked over the other two things that we tried. So we're we're really eager to point out things that didn't go well as well. But the case studies are real people. So that's the structure of every chapter. That's that's awesome. I know your book is the first brain training guide to really combine both the the clinical science and and real world experience and i know that's uh that's something very unique about your book in particular and simon like you said while not all the chapters may apply to everybody it's it's kind of cool that you guys have set it up so that it people can read the chapters that do really resonate with them and um uh, just i know um the one in particular i'm just going to as for me as an example The one you just listed that really has always resonated with me is the social media thing, the comparison trap. And uh, yeah, we had uh, just actually a couple weeks ago, we had one of our coaches, Michael Hammond, on the show, and we talked very extensively about that in particular. That's a that's a big one for runners, I think. So uh, I'm glad you touched on that. But at the core of all of these different mental barriers uh, is this this theory that you and Leslie have at the at the beginning of your book and it's the um the theory that the brain is broken into three different parts and i love this you you talked about this in our last interview together but these three parts are the chimp brain computer brain and professor brain and uh (laughs) yeah so simon can you just tell us what that what those each represent and how you guys came up with those names yeah. And in fact, it's important to point out here that, you know, thinking of the brain as, as has different parts and roles is not new. We certainly didn't invent that idea is, is you know, there's uh, a lot of people have written about the fact that, you know, you might have seen the, um, the uh, David Kahneman book, Thinking Far Slow mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. Jonathan Haidt, Happiness. And the notion that we've got like 
like a voice inside of our head that's like, you know, the rational, so there's the emotional, impulsive side of us, then we've got the rational side of us. That notion go, dates, you know, is, is, is a very um, uh, um, well established in, in psychology. But, but what we did um, is that we kind of tried to bring it into like everyday uh, 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 life or th- uh, use a metaphor that would probably be a little bit easier to understand. In fact, we didn't even invent that either. See, we're, we're really, uh, we really don't have much of an original idea at all. But it came from a guy called Dr. Steve Peters, who invented, invented, who, who kind of coined this chimp brain uh, mm-hmm. metaphor. He's a forensic psychiatrist in Britain and a sports psychologist and a fantastic, in fact, I recommend that book uh, should be on every athlete's bookshelf. It's called The Chimp Paradox by Steve Peters. Um, so, uh, get that. And so at its core is the fact that our brain, and I know I talked about this in the, in the summit, so I don't want to sort of, you know, uh, uh bore you senseless. No, here that's fine for, but, for our listeners that didn't catch that. I'm, I'm oh, okay. definitely glad to talk about it again. Yeah. So, you you know, our brain has evolved over millions of years, five to six million years, probably more actually five to six million years. And it's evolved at different rates. Parts of our brains, you know, were there before other parts and so on. And our brain is just like a tree in that fact. If you cut open a tree and you count the rings in the middle, the old, the part in the middle the, is the oldest part and the part on the outside is the newest part. So the part you actually see when you look at a human brain, the wrinkly cortex part on the outside, that's where all of our rational, logical thinking happening happens. And that only really Really started to develop over the last two million years. So, mm-hmm. for, for for three or four million years, we didn't really have much of a frontal cortex at all. We only had what we call a limbic system. There are other parts of the brain as well. We had like the, you know, like the the brain stem and the cerebellum and other other things. But in essence, this limbic system, kind of the size of an avocado, that sits mm-hmm. right in the centre of our brain, that sits atop your brain stem, and that's where all of the your all of your emotions are generated. It's where a lot of uh, uh, structures that you might have heard of, like the hippocampus and the amygdala and all these sort of old uh, uh, Latin sounding names, these structures in there. And it's very primitive. It's been there. And its goal is to keep us alive. So it feeds us very powerful sort of feelings and impressions to get us to run, fight or hide. Right. It's the fight or flight response. That's where it all is located in the in the limbic system or the chimp brain. And we call it a chimp because it acts very much like a young primate. Sometimes it can be soft and cuddly. Uh, motions that we get are positive and, and lovely to have, uh, but others are really frustrating or they can be angry or they can be you know, desperate to have some need met in us. So all of our emotions, human, the reason humans have emotion is to drive decision-making. So we, we need this part of our brain, but the trouble is, is that the survival instinct that it has was developed or formed millions of years ago. And so now our lives are rarely in danger. In fact, if you live in the suburbs and we just, you know, we we have, you know, boring jobs and we like to train and race, very rarely are we going to be in true life or death situations. But your, your limbic system doesn't know that. The amygdala, a little part of your limbic system, like a little sensory radar, picks up information from your senses, from your ears and your eyes and all your, t- all your senses, and it processes them five times quicker than the, than the rational, logical professor brain of yourself. So it's um, it processing information in your environment very quickly. And then once it's processed, it, it kind of decides what's threatening or not. And it's using kind of medi- not medieval, prehistoric logic, right, to determine what's threatening. And it sets off a whole cascade of of hormones and neurotransmitters in the brain to get us primed and ready to run, fight, or, or hide. And, and even, in fact, there are some things that it's worried about, like protecting us from being the, 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 the holy trinity of being a scaredy cat uh, for your brain, or where your brain will literally shit the bed if you force it to do this, mm-hmm. is to be humiliated, embarrassed, or shown to be inadequate, right? Mm-hmm. Those three things. So if you ever put yourself in situations where that's a possibility, of course your brain is going to crap the bed and say, don't do this. What are you doing? Do something that you're good at. Fine. You don't need or make up some reason why an excuse not to go. And the reason for that is because millions of years ago, uh, being humiliated, embarrassed, around it was that did actually mean a pretty miserable future because you got ostracized from your troop. You had to forage for your food on your own. You had to defend yourself and you probably would die. So, but nowadays we don't, it's just kind of ridiculous that we still get wide, but that fight or flight response is still there. So meanwhile, uh, in normal rational logical land, in the professor brain, which is the real you, 
So when you think about what you want to do with life and what's important and the ability to do math and think about how do I qualify for Boston, uh, you know, and whilst also to have I, you know, I must watch Stranger Things. I'm on episode five. All the, inter- all the, all the way that we think about lives is all your professor brain. It's all an analysis, logic and rational thinking. And of course, if that's all we had, we didn't, if we didn't have a limbic system, we'd always make perfectly rational, logical decisions. We'd be boring as anything, uh, but we'd always make rational decisions. And if only we, if we, if we only had a limbic system, a chimp and no professor, we'd be in jail, all of us, because we'd steal, we'd hump anything, we'd, whatever urge we felt, we'd just get that need met. We don't care about other people's feelings and so on. So now we've got a bit of a a problem on our hands because on the one hand, your chimp brain is saying, why have you signed up for this half marathon? You know, you, 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 you don't, you know, you've never been out. This is your first time. You probably can't go to this. You haven't really done the training and all the people out there, the real athletes, what are you doing? The chimp talk, which is, you know, very powerful and telling us to, uh, to, to, to find another thing to do instead. Don't do this. Mm. But meanwhile, your professor brain is saying, but I've paid $175 for this and I've done the training and I've paid a coach. And if I don't get out of bed at 530, I, you know, I'm not going to get the training down and my training and the logic of it. And there's a fight going on between part of your head that wants to keep you away from potential embarrassment <laughs> and there's a part of your brain that says, come on, it's just a damn race. You can do this. And most of the time uh, we, we lose that fight because the chimp is five times quicker and five times stronger than you, than, your, than the real you, your professor. So our, our puny professor brain is trying to say, listen, you're standing on the start line and you have what psychologists politely call thoughts of escape. Mm. And that what that means is, oh, my God, why am I doing I'm never doing this again. Who taught me into this? I'm never fucking doing this again. This is miserable. You know, you're praying to, 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 for it to be cancelled or something, you know. <laughs> um, and so the, the net result is that we go through life uh, and we approach our sport with a feeling of mental anguish or having these thoughts and things that we don't want. And that simply reflects that your chimp brain has got the better of you. It's hijacked your brain as an in charge of you. So that's what we're trying to battle uh, with our what's what the book's designed to do. And that's why this mental model to understand that at the source of all these problems, whether it's I feel fat or I wish I felt more like an athlete or setting goals, it comes down to a battle between brains. We haven't talked about the computer brain. We don't need to do that for now. There is another brain involved. But in essence, we need to win that fight. And in fact, we often say, you know what? You don't even have to win it. You just have to be very good at becoming a cattle wrangler, a chimp wrangler. We have to manage it just as uh, you would if there was a toddler having a tantrum in the grocery store. If you just try and go hard handed, it rarely works. We have to use bribery. We have to use kind of soft talk. We have to kind of use all the tricks that we can to talk the chimp off the ledge and to go back in its cage and back to sleep. So we can get, you know, back on with just the normal routine thing of running. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Uh, I love the way you've broken that down. And it's so interesting that the chimp brain is still so uh, influential to our, our feelings to this day. It's, it's interesting that it falls back all the way to um, kind of prehistoric times. there. So going off of that, like you said, it's kind of to to really wrangle the chimp brain. It really does take a conscious effort and it takes mental training and kind of training that would be akin to what would you what would you do for training for a marathon, for instance. So going off that, Simon, when you're dealing with your clients, what is the first step you have them take when when trying to kind of squash those the um chimp brain thoughts and really just kind of veering back to professor brain territory. Yeah. So the first step is to get to know their chimp, (laughs) right? (laughs) So you're on the phone and you might say, okay, Hey Mary, this is great that, you know, you've told me about your training. So can I, do you mind that, you know, we've obviously, we've spoken a little about the chimp model or they've read the book or they get the concept and say, I wonder if you could just kind of put your chimp on the line for a moment. You know, what would they say? Or, or we get, if that feels too silly or ridiculous to say, well, tell me about the kinds of the brand of crazy that your chimp feeds you. <laughs> so here's what my chimp says, my chimp. So we get them to the, you know, really important to give your chimp a name and a characteristic. And so you almost think of it like another person or a character in your head. And, and psychologically, that's really powerful because what we're doing is trying to get some detachment from the emotional experience, from the sort of analytical, rational experience, right? At the moment, 
all they are is all these balls spinning around in your head like a pinball machine, emotions and thoughts and self-talk and feelings. And it's all jumbled up. So we need to get some separation. And so by giving it a character, we say, okay, let me, if you don't want to, if, if it feels a bit too weird to, to, to put your chimp on the phone, what I want you to do is write down uh, in unedited chimp talk, unfiltered chimp talk, and then send that to me over an email. And they say, what do you, what do you mean by that? And so sometimes I'll send them examples of chimp talk from other athletes. But I say the, the important point is, you know, all those, you know, those voices that you hear in your head about telling you you're not good enough or whatever it is that the issue that they're describing uh, with, you know, one of these 13 issues, say, I want to hear really clearly what they're trying to say. And I want you, I'm talking to, as though I was talking to Mary on the phone, I, I don't want you, Mary, the real you, to get in the way of it. I don't want you to start saying, uh, you know, I know this is silly to think this, but, you know, that's when your professor brain is sort of rationalizing the, the mm. chimp. I want to get rid of that. I just want, I know that it looks crazy. I know it's not the real you, but let's just get it out there. So we call it a, like a chimp purge or a chimp talk. So some, for some people, it's like a paragraph. For some people, it's five pages of single space text. And some of it might even be, when you find yourself doing this, you might start off with, um, you know, I look down on the start line and I just feel like a, you know, a chunky monkey in my, in my lycra. I'm squeezed into this suit. I'm looking around and everyone is fitter, leaner, stronger than me. And I'm thinking, who the hell do you think you are? You, and you pay for a coach. You don't deserve to have a coach, you know, and on it. And we know it's nonsense. And, we, mm. and, and what happens when you do that? You, you want, it kind of spins off into other things. It might be, you know, because, uh, you know, aspects of uh, out there training, not just racing or other aspects of the life. But you get a good sense of where it's coming from. And that gives us the basis to find themes in their chimp talk, because no amount of one size fits all, no, no amount of, you know, you know, off the shelf sports psychology strategy will help you if it's, if it's trying to affect something that you don't deal with. So if someone who has chimp talk that's dominated by proving themselves, they must win to feel successful, is very different than someone's chimp who thinks that they really don't feel worthy as an athlete because of the way they look, right? Mm -hmm. So they're quite different types of chimp. So, you know, the, the exercises that you give someone will be quite different. So understanding their chimp talk is absolutely the first thing. And it's kind of a funny little exercise that you go on with them. And like Leslie races now uh, under her chimp was so powerful uh, mm. that, yes, she throws a lot of these strategies that one of the, her go to techniques is called an alter ego. Mm. So she actually races as somebody else. I know it sounds balmy to think of this, but but thinking of yourself in the third person actually has a very strong therapeutic tradition in psychology. Like, you know, you, you see yourself, what would you say to yourself if you were sat here now, or, you know, the talking, the, the cliche of talking to the puppet, you know, when they're doing kids psychology, but the, the notion of detachment, thinking of yourself in the third person is really powerful. So Leslie will say, okay, she had her alter ego is an Irish MMA fighter uh, <laughs> called Pad, Paddy McGinty. And so because, she, you know, Leslie's like a little umpa lumpa, right? She's like five foot two, tiny. And then she's around these pro athlete women who are like Amazonians. You know, they're broad shoulders and tall. They look as though they would eat Leslie for breakfast, some of them, right? So Leslie, no amount of self-talk could convince Leslie that she was five foot 11, right? She's this tiny little thing. So so what she did is to say, look, I, my alter ego, I might be small, but my and, and her natural personality is, oh, no, you go first. Or oh, I'm sorry, I didn't want to get in the way. And, you know, kind of. Uh, but that's not in the heat of battle, in the heat of competition. She needs to be a badass. Right. Mm -hmm. So so what she does is and her acting background helped her develop characters. And there's some really interesting research in neuroscience now that faking it till you make it, you know, mm -hmm. like adopting the characteristics, the attributes of something that you want to be like actually changes brain chemistry. It's quite remarkable. And we call it in psychology, it's called embodied cognition. So if you can embody the what you the an attribute, the cognition will change as well, the thought. So so she races this lot, little and she has this whole little ritual, the clothes that she wears, the way she stares, the kind of music she listens to, and she gets out of character when she stops racing. And so that alone is a way to say, listen, if you've got a, such a powerful chimp that in some instances, no, um, you just can't seem to escape from the 800 pound gorilla in your head. <laughs> let's just get step out of that skin and into someone who is a more of a match. So 
it might be someone that you admire. It might be a, like a fictional character. It might, you know, depending. And so you can have fun with it. And actors do it all the time, you know, and it works for sport too. But you won't find that in any sports psychology book. But it's really powerful. That, wow. That is fascinating. I've never heard of anything like that, but I'm, I'm so tempted to, to try it out. Uh, that's, that's so <laughs> well, fascinating. Well, in our, in our book, we have an alter ego worksheet. Uh, and so we walk you step by step. And the case study in this one is Leslie, because this is how we developed hers. And so it's almost like you're doing some research on the backstory. So tell me about where you're athlete, what kind of childhood your alter ego, what kind of childhood they had, why they like the way they are, what are they out to prove. And, and sometimes the alter ego is not a very nice person at all. Right. So we're not trying to say that this is a, you know, a, a nice, respectable person to it's, it's to say, how can I for one, you know, for 30 minutes, for two hours, for four hours, how can I step into the skin of somebody who doesn't give a shit about what people <laughs> think? They're badass, you know, they fight to the end. And that's really what it's designed. You have to learn to turn that off, as I found out the hard way. I don't mm -hmm. want to, when Leslie comes back from training and she's still in Paddy McGinty mode and she's kind of a <laughs> bitch, she's kind of, a, you know, a, so we don't want that. It's, a, it's actually a, f a funny story about this because we were, we did a talk in um, in uh, in Boston and and there was a, another pro triathlete I won't name her but another pro triathlete who we know and is raced on the who came who lived in the town she came to hear us talk and she came up to afterwards and said it's funny Les because I always thought you were a total bitch <laughs> oh, God. it's funny and Les is like what no I'm not I can see you and I and she said, I didn't realize because I only ever saw, you know, in races and not in a bit it's like she would swear at people, but, you know, yeah. kind of a cold, steely stare and didn't seem. Uh, and we didn't really get to know her after the races and stuff. So we didn't know her socially. And she now knows that all the person that she met was the alter ego. Not she wasn't thinking the real Leslie. And it was kind of a little bit of a funny moment for us. Oh, my God. People actually believe that this is what you're like. Yeah, <laughs> that's so funny. I, I know the feeling. I know um, I, I kind of have that kind of uh, steely um, kind of uh, external shell when I'm when I'm racing. And I know a lot of uh, a lot of my friends do as well. And it's it's funny talking to uh, your competitors after the race as opposed to right before. That's so, that's so interesting. So Simon, going off of that, you, you said something really interesting in there. And that was that obviously these, these anxieties, these uh, chimp thoughts, they do stem from other anxieties in our life. They, they're, you know, apply to a lot of different things besides our actual athletic performance. So when you have your clients kind of go through all of this mental training, they, they're more capable of kind of uh, separating those chimp thoughts from their professor thoughts. Do, do they tend to see uh, improvement in other aspects of their lives and, and, and kind of see improvements in the anxieties they might have uh, elsewhere? Yeah, because, you know, these are life skills, right? I mean, um, and in fact, not to, to make that point, we've done quite a lot of talks in, uh, in you know, bike shops and, and running shops and stuff and stores. And some people have come along and said, you know, I, I, um, uh, uh, I've been dragged along by my partner who's a runner or a triathlete and I'm nothing to, I don't really do any active, but, you know, what the book has really told me is that I understand now, like why I'm like I am at work or dealing with, I have to make, I have to manage lots of people. I have to give presentations. or I'm really not that assertive to ask for a raise or I get so nervous about, you know, uh, dating or, you know, whatever other aspect in our life where we want to be the best, we, you know, best us that we can be. And, and so these things are, you know, the, the, the real secret in uh, the, the kind of the, the shush moment in our book, the secret is that it's really not just about sport. It's about, managing thoughts and things that you don't want that are in all aspects of our lives. And it might not even be like a performance situation, like you you don't, you know, at work or something. It might just be how, you know, for parents, we've had some parents come up to us and said, you know what? It's funny because when I get so mad with why my teenager uh, is saying this and that and what I, my response is, and now I know that uh, they're talking to me with their chimp brain. Mm -hmm. And my initial reaction is to parent back with my, with my own chimp. So I need to recognize that I need to get my professor in charge to parent, right? You can't, ch when it's chimp on chimp, it never ends well, right? <laughs> so, so in those sorts of situations, and, you know, the lesson is that, you know, 
shoot, you know, don't shoot from the hip or think before you act. And it's the same thing, right? It's about recognizing that you're in a highly charged emotional situation. You're likely to be impulsive or say something you might regret later or, or do something that you might regret later and how I can sort of talk my chimp off the ledge, think rationally, and then come back with something that is going to be more productive. So that, that, that's a lesson that is not specific to sport. It's in all of us, right? Mm, yeah, absolutely. That's, I, that's what I love about your book is that it, it doesn't really apply only to performance anxiety and, and, and improving your, your mental edge and, and, um, the world of athletics, but it's also it applies to every other aspect of your life. So I love that yeah. about your book. And uh, Simon, I'll link your book in our show notes. Obviously, people can go check out your website as well. Can um, how, how can people work with you guys if, if they want to uh, kind of uh, work with you guys in terms of co- consultation? Can they reach out to you via your website? Yeah, yeah. So they can contact us directly from our email addresses, uh, which are on the website themselves, or or we have something on our website called a smog test. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, a, and I know it's a smog test is um, uh, a little where you um, you write about yourselves or your sport. And it's a no strings, it's a free thing, and you send it. It's a few little questions like what kind of training you do at the moment, what are the th- what are the what are your goals, what are the things you struggle with, and then we give you a call. And for 10 minutes, we chat about your training. We're not trying to sell you on our coaching. We're just trying to talk about, you know, here's some things. Have you tried this? Have you tried that? And, and, and we designed that in essence because we thought that, you know, some people will, they, they're going to reach out. Well, I've got, already got a coach, but I'm really interested in what another coach would say. And, you know, but I don't want to hire another coach. So it was just a way for us to, to have a discussion with other athletes. And the most important thing for us is that we learn about who our clients are or who the athletic community is, how they think and feel, things that they struggle with. And that makes us better coaches, whether you end up being our, our athlete or not. So, so they can do this smog test and we call them. And then sometimes people say, yeah, I'd like to sign up for coaching or get a book a session with me for psychology. Or sometimes it's, hey, thanks a lot. Uh, I've, it's been great. And on you go. So it's a no strings attached way of sort of reaching out and having a discussion about the things that you're struggling with. That's that's awesome. I will definitely link your website in our show notes. And uh, and I know your book is in uh, people can also buy it in audio format. Is that right? It is. Yeah. Leslie and I insisted on on recording it for pro- I don't know whether that was a good idea or not. So Leslie's has a thick Scottish accent and I've obviously got an English <laughs> accent. So we we alternate chapters. So uh, whether you can understand uh, <laughs> us or not, but it's us. So if you think, oh, my God, who are these boring people? I apologize. It's us. No, that that only adds to the charm. An English <laughs> accent and a, a Scottish accent. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's awesome. No. Well, I think, I mean, so many of our listeners are probably listening to this while they're running. So they're definitely, I feel like going to be probably interested in that audio version. So we'll link all of that in the show notes. But Simon, thank you so much for coming on the show to to kind of tell us a little bit about all this. It's so fascinating. And uh, I feel like we've kind of just hit the tip of the iceberg today. But um, it's just, I, I'm so glad to have talked to you about this and definitely would love to do so again in the future at some point. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having us. We're big fans of Runners Connect. So uh, yeah, keep up. The more we can sort of spread the word of how to be a better you on race day, that that we all win. What I especially love about Simon's approach to performance psychology is how individualized it is and how much he really takes into account. Yes, we might all have chimp brains, but our chimps have different voices. We all have our own set of anxieties and doubts, and I love how Simon and his wife Leslie have designed the Brave Athlete so that the reader can skip to the chapters that best suit their needs. Again, if you want a shot at a free signed copy with a personalized message from Simon and Leslie, you can enter to win at runnersconnect.net forward slash winner. The contest will end Thursday, December 28th. 2017 at 12 p.m. Eastern, so be sure to get your name in fast. And if you'd like a little breakdown of everything mentioned today, including links, you can find the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC347. Again, that's runnersconnect.net forward slash RC347. I think that'll just about do it for the day, but thank you so much again for joining me, and I hope you do so again next time. Until then, happy holidays and have a wonderful week. Thanks for listening to the Run to the Top podcast from runnersconnect.net. 